Hi, I'm Mara Webster within Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled to have you all joining us for today's conversation to talk about the movie The Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain. We're so fortunate today to be joined by the always wonderful Frankie Faison to talk about playing the titular character of Kenneth. And the first thing that I wanted to talk about is the fact that this is a movie which is a true story, and it was also made with Kenneth's family being incredibly supportive and being a part of the creative process. Um, and I always think it's so interesting, that journey of, of playing someone who is a, a real character and wanting to really tell the story in a way that is is honoring them and, and their experience, particularly for a story like this. And at the same time, it's still being told through a narrative structure within a film. And it's he's not someone that unfortunately audiences, you know, audiences don't know what his voice sounded like, what his mannerisms were. So there is a little bit of freedom as well. So what were the spaces where you felt like you really needed to be incredibly true to him in how you portrayed him specifically? And the spaces where you felt like you had a little bit of freedom with the medium of film and how the story was being told well i felt that uh every at every moment i had the uh luxury to um to portray him from 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 what i saw in this character rather than to try and and do a duplicate a duplication or replica of who because i never met the character i never heard his voice I never spoke to him. I never spoke to any of his family members or anyone. So it's me coming in this as an actor who has been presented an amazing script, an amazing story that's based on the true facts of a man who he was. And I felt that if they wanted it to be more of a, um, people wanted to, you know, like if you do great characters, like Morgan Freeman is doing, uh, he's, our, he's one of our producers. And he's done Nelson Mandela. Now, when you do somebody like Nelson Mandela, you really have to study him because people, the world knows who he is. They know, they've seen him. And, and, but with Kenneth Chamberlain, nobody knew who he was, uh, except for his family and, you know, and friends and stuff. So I had license to create what I thought would be the essence of who he was. And, that's, uh, and sometimes when you do that, you can be fortunate enough to capture the essence of who the character is and it will come to you. And when people see that, you know, you will, they will see, they will see something of this man and his family was overwhelmingly supportive and, and, and complimentary to me. And they said, you know, we saw our father, our uncle, our cousin, our friend up there in you and his son has said the same thing. And to me, that's the most rewarding thing that I could ever expect to get. And so it just, it all came from the script that David Madell had written and from the sounds that I heard coming from this story and this man. So that's how that all came about. And, and in terms of, of an acting exercise, it's a really interesting way to have to approach a performance because the, the experience in the film is that he's inside of his apartment and the police have shown up outside the door and we get a sense of, of some of his relationships with his family, his niece is outside the door, he makes a lot of phone calls, and yet he's the only person actually inside of his apartment. And so you're giving the majority of your performance either to a conversation through a wall and through a door, or to someone on the phone where you don't have a scene partner in the room. And so how was that a unique challenge in terms of approaching the majority of the film as a singular performer in your scenes? Well, to me, I thrive on unique challenges. I mean, I am just, I've always been that kind of actor. It's just, I try to be very organic and moment to moment, I try to deal with what's presented to me. And if I'm playing a role where I don't see anyone, there's only people on the other side of the door, it's, I still have to find the truth in that. And it's, uh, to me, it was, it was, um, it was a great challenge. And I, I, I loved it. It's almost, it was very close to theater, about as close to theater as you could actually get because you do this, this all happens in pretty much in real time. So you get to do the beginning, middle and end of this man's final uh, couple of hours on this planet. So it was never a challenge for me to, to do that because for me, I'm dealing with the sounds 
that are coming out of this man, his out of his head, you know, the horror, the terror that's, you know, that's preeminent in his encounter with these law enforcement trying to bang his door down and get inside of his house and maybe harm him in some way or whatever. And I think that that's the thing that makes this film exceptional because you get a chance to see the victim, what's going on with the victim who has been, you know, who, who the, uh, who the police officer, usually you, if you shoot someone, then that's it. You'll hear other people, maybe friends or whatever. They do interviews They say he was a great guy, but you're not seeing what's going on with him through those last moments. And this, this was in real time, a couple of hours. And to preserve, present that, I think that it uh, shows a touch of humanity and hopefully people will respond to it in a way and says, and realize how wrong it, this was and uh, how they would fight to make sure that nothing like this happens again. There was yeah. mental illness, there was, he's an ex-Marine, he's by himself, he's dealing with people who have uh, uh, prefabricated notions about who he, who he is from the moment they walk into the building. You know, it's just, he, it's a lost cause. And just to, I like to rally for the, uh, for the little guy, I like to, for the underdog, I really do, I'm a big fan of that. And this is, this was my situation in dealing with this story of this man. Yeah, and, and, and I love that you're bringing up the fact that this is a story that's being told, you know, almost to the minute in the amount of time that this encounter unfortunately took to happen. And one of the very first things that he does when the police show up at his door is say that he doesn't want to let them in because he mm -hmm. absolutely knows where this scenario could likely and will likely end up for him um, because of those preconceived notions that, that you were talking about. And so how did you and David talk about and really collaborate on finding a lot of the beats as that tension starts to build, as they continue to really rise the situation outside the door, what that does to him emotionally and mentally and how you really wanted to capture that journey in your performance? Well, the essence of what's going on with Kenneth Chamberlain is there, is there on the page, very clear. And uh, there was not much that we needed to do, except for David allowed me the space to, because in this, with this character, more so than with most characters that I do, I mean, most work that I do, I had to stay with him from the beginning to the middle to the end. And, you know, I uh, just, um, from the moment that I decided to play him, he started entering my body and he couldn't leave. And when we started production, I was Kenneth Chamberlain. I remained Kenneth Chamberlain. And those sounds that just, I mean, David would talk me through certain things. He would say, you know, uh, there's, uh, you know, some, some things from the war. Sometimes he goes back, you know, he's go back and forth. He hears those sounds and he's discombobulated. He's not exactly sure where he is. And, and in this scene, he'll, um, he'll be very frantic and, and, and until he gets a call from a family member and then he switches gears because he wants to be protective of his family. But at the same time, he's really still fighting for this, 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 this he's, he's fighting for his right to be in his apartment and he's fighting for his right to not have outside forces invade his apartment without without a warrant you know it's his constitutional right so we talked those were the moments that we had highlighted and talked about and it was just so but you don't try to play you know you don't try to play the you know the you let it come to you is what I'm saying, because if you try to play it, it, you'll get something that's completely different and completely wrong. I know in your life, I know in my life, I've come across people who I find out later on that, that person uh, uh, is autistic. They, they're high on the spectrum of autism or, or this person has this or, or this uh, he, he is, is there. But when you're encountering them, it's not like, hey, someone has come up to you and say, look, I'm autistic. Uh, you know, you have to deal with me this way. It's like you observe, you treat people the way that they present themselves to you. And this is the way that uh, we dealt with finding this character of Kenneth Chamberlain. And it's, um, it, it was a great way of working, you know, and uh, trust from the director and from the actor. 
And you you were bringing up mention there of, of the fact that he was a veteran and the fact that that influences things like when there's a loud noise outside that it, it almost carries him back to a different place and there's that dealing with PTSD for him. What were some of the other aspects that came into him as a character from the fact that he had served and was a veteran for you? Well, his ability to evaluate a situation and to be able to set up some sort of, I mean, he had a, it was comical almost. He had a makeshift, you know, fortress set up, you know, he put the couch on the door and he took some duct tape and wrapped it around the things. And, you know, that wouldn't, that wouldn't last very long when you got burly men banging on the door. He, he grabbed the knife. I mean, he had all the, all the uh, impulses of a, of a train military man to you know to defend himself he grabbed the lamp and, and this lamp just fell apart he's jabbering it at the people you know it's those are the things that but here again you now you got a man who is almost 70 years old a man with a heart condition a man who is stamina is you know his breathing is compromised so though i think those are the things that uh the instincts were there but he didn't have anything other than that. He could not have a fortress that was impenetrable. It was one that uh, could be easily reached, and, and, and they did. But at the same time, throughout this film, you see that this is a very rational, sane man in a lot of ways, because he's basically saying it was a mistake. Go away. I don't, I don't want you into my house. Uh, leave me alone. He, and someone report, you know, mentioned earlier, at the end of the film, he's saying, this thing, this moment will be recorded in history. People will know what you have done to me. And, you know, and uh, just one of my favorite lines is when he's in the throes of things and he cries out, President Obama, help me, help me, please. You know, and um, it's, it's, that's all of that has to do with him as a military man, because like I say, you, you have the instincts, but they're no longer there. It's like seeing a great athlete who was, who's past his time. You know, someone who was doing amazing things in the prime of his time. And now you see him as a 60 year old man. And you say, wow, this is the guy who did all that stuff. And you see him maybe crippled from the knee down from all the jumping and running. And, and you know, he can't do those things, but you feel instinctually like, boy, he probably could have, and he was probably great at doing it. So, and that that's the love that I embrace about this man, because in the way in which he, you see, he is in the throes of, of, of banging and slamming and all this stuff. And then he gets a phone call from a relative. And he's just like, all of a sudden he's like, oh, hey, how's, tell the baby I said hello. Uh, no, no, don't come down here. I'm fine because his, that's also a military kind of thing. His thing is to protect those that he loved and not put them in harm's way. So I had a lot of, I had a lot of stuff to, uh, a lot of fuel to draw upon in 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 creating this character, which I love. Yeah, there's there's so many elements and it really captures a lot of the layers and the richness richness of him. And and you were talking just now about, you know, he was a man with a heart condition. And there's that that moment where we see you in your performance going towards an oxygen oxygen tank and, and really physically needing air. And then there's also just the physical buildup in his body from the escalating situation that's happening as well. Did you find that a lot of the physical elements and a lot of the physical responses that happen to this this building tension and this building situation were something that you found very intrinsically or were you kind of thinking cognizantly about, you know, oh, this would be physically impacting him in this way because of X, Y, Z at certain points? It was very intrinsic. You know, I just, I didn't have to, I mean, it, it made perfect sense. I mean, you know, and plus the fact this role exhausted me. It really exhausted me for me to stand there and physically try to hold that door shut and to move from this place to the next place. And plus the environment that I was in, it was hot and musty in that place that we shot it. And it was like everything that I did was just, I mean, David may have led me to certain places. Like he says, at this point, I want you to go over and, you know, and take in the oxygen. I needed that oxygen. 
and I needed to sit down. I needed to drink the water. I needed to get some air. I really, you know, like none of that stuff was 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 uh, preconceived. There's stuff that just intrinsically it was right. And I'm, you know, like I, I'm a very physical actor. I've always relied upon the physicality of what the character is doing and what what he's about. And in this one, especially, it uh, it served me very well. So. And and obviously throughout the entire film, you're you're in a not very large apartment, and yet we really get so many senses of him as a person through a lot of the personal effects. You know, we see, you know, certain corners where there's a bunch of mess, and he hasn't necessarily picked up after himself for a few days, and that tells us details about his day to day and the way that he he lives a little bit at this point. Um, and so, how did David work with you in really utilizing that location and blocking a lot of the scenes to the point where it does bring us around to all of the different corners to tell a story, you know, and I think that even goes back to what you were talking about with his experience as a veteran, where he's really going to each of these corners as well as part of a, trying to find a logical solution and a way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And David was very meticulous to show different elements of this small apartment where he lived. And, you know, it, it, it just even, even now, I mean, it just, uh, because I'm, when they finally break through the door, I'm saying that should be it. But then there's another maybe 10 minutes of still or so of the film left because he runs to his bedroom and hides behind the dresser. And they don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, wow, because that's what he would do. And they can't just go running in there because they really don't know if he has any kind of uh, weapon or something beyond that little knife. And so it just, I mean, in this small apartment, there was so much detail and so much activity that uh, I give kudos to, to, to the designers and to, to the creative team and to the camera, the camera operators and to David for just making sure that all that stuff is highlighted. You feel, you feel this apartment and you certainly do feel like it's not a place that you would particularly want to live, you know, because it's not, it's, it's it, it has those elements, you know, they just unkept an unkept place, you know, and even the way that Kenneth Chamberlain is dressed like I, it's funny because I wear these knee pads in this um, in this um, in the film. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but uh, underneath the robe and shorts, I have these knee pads on. And I talked to David about that because I said, David, I I have knees that sometimes go out. They're kind of bad. So I think that this character could have bad knees too. And we, David thought, and you know, we talked about it. He said, oh, absolutely. You can incorporate that into who, because that's all contributes to the makeup of who this man is. He was a man with bad knees, okay? And then he's still, but he's still trying to do the things that he's trying to do. So I think all of that, it was just, that kind of detail is just, it makes this film what it is, I think. It absolutely does. And, and you know, you were bringing up as well the, the scene where the police do finally break through the door and the fact that then there's still another 10 minutes of, of what that is. And there's a lot of frenetic energy and David really brings the camera right into the center of all of you. Um, and I imagine that was a really grueling scene to film that probably took a number of takes in order for David to really capture all of the different moments within that that he wanted to. And so what was the journey of that scene coming together with all of you and just figuring out all of the different moments well you'd be surprised to know that they didn't have the luxury to do a lot of takes <laughs> this is a truly independent low budget film but you know they did have great people great operate um this was shot my stuff was shot in eight days oh. and on the other side of the door they shut, took about eight days to shoot that but i wasn't even there and people weren't there when i was there but the f there were two camera operators and they we all sort of did a dance together. At every moment that I'm filming, there's a camera in my face, one in my face. And it was like, it becomes sort of like your inner conscious, something like that. And then they're just, and we, I had to have the trust uh, of these camera operators as well. That's how they were able to get the intimacy of, a lot of these things, you feel like you're, you're right 
in Kenneth Chamberlain's head, you're right, in the police officer's head, you're right there because of the way in which it was shot. They didn't have time to do elaborate setups, you know. Sometimes you can take take one or two days to shoot one scene because they want to, they got to change the angles of this, but we didn't have that. So we had to rely upon the, uh, the flexibility of the camera operators and, and, and me trusting them. It's hard. It's hard to, but that's why I had to find my way and always be in Kenneth Chamberlain's head because otherwise I would have been self-conscious of having the camera like right here in my face and right here, one here, one there, one there. I forgot about them completely. I never even thought about the uh, cameras being there. And when we did that final scene down there on the floor, it was just no... It, because for two reasons. One is he didn't want to waste a lot of takes on that because it was so physically exhausting and he didn't want to risk harm to me. And um, so we, you know, there were only maybe about two or three takes of that, that stuff. It was just, it was very concise and everybody knew what they were doing and, and we got it, thank God. Because every time I did that, I, I I hurt. I hurt, you know, so. And because you were moving so fast and you're bringing up the fact that you were filming in just eight days, I'm sure that there was very little time to really talk through a lot of things or really rehearse a lot before you were filming scenes. Did you and David have much of an opportunity to talk through some of the character aspects and, and some of the scene dynamics before filming a little bit more? Or was it really having to just work from this like very instinctive place where the two of you had to find this really immediate, intimate shorthand with each other? a good question and and the answer is both you know if um if we weren't prepared to do a scene we would take the time to talk about doing it but most of the stuff was so well presented and it was it was it was it, you know i knew what i had to do and david knew what he had to do uh, sometime he's over there setting up the scene the next shot and how it's going to be done and we've already talked about how it's going to be done and I'm just there waiting for them to say action and uh, see what happens. A lot of it was just about that, and um, we we didn't we didn't need we didn't need to do a lot of rehearsal. We didn't need to do. Uh, I mean, we did the talk. I mean, you know, sometimes I would be up in my room waiting for them to set up whatever little setup they had to do, and David would come up just say, "How you doing? You got any questions?" I said, "No." Uh, if, I, or if I had one, I would ask him and he would say, yeah, well, this or that. And, you know, and he was always very clear about it. But we didn't, we just, that script was so brilliant. It was so tight. It was so, it gave me so much. I mean, I'll tell you, there's an old thing that actors always say um, about uh, how to actually do a good job is to, is to say your lines and not bump them to the furniture. And that, <laughs> I felt this was the true essence of that in this script because he had given me so much and all I had to do was really, I had to say my lines and, and, and deal with the inner emotions that I was having from the character and not bump into the furniture, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> or sometimes you had to bump into the furniture, but it was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you find that in the way that you and David worked together that there was a slightly different style and sense of collaboration with one another? Because even going back to what we were talking about earlier where you didn't have scene partners in the room and it really was, he was the only person that you had that you could, you could look to, that you could have those moments that you could figure out those beats were. And so did it create a different style of intimacy than the one that you often have with directors and other projects? I don't think so. Mm. Because, I, you know, like if... You can't change the stripes on a leopard, they say, you know, I don't know where I even came up with that. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, no, it's, uh, you know, my my work process is, is very collaborative anyway. And uh, I'm used to working with all kinds of directors. So it's, uh, it's not a big deal for me. I mean, you bring whatever you're going to bring to the table. I'm going to bring whatever I'm going to bring if you, and you, but the main thing is, 
you have to be able to collaborate, I think, with me as an actor, because I'm just not going to, otherwise I, I can't do my work and I, can't, I couldn't do justice to your project. But David was very, it was like a match made in heaven. We just, uh, we, we, we blended very well. We, and I knew that because I had to come into this situation. Like I said, it's a very low budget film, even though you don't, you wouldn't notice that from watching it. And, um, and we just, I didn't know anything about David. He knew about me because he chose me and he asked me to come in and do this. But I didn't know anything about him. I mean, I had seen none of his films. I mean, he's done some things, but it wasn't a lot. And, uh, but people say, how could you do that? How could you go in there and do, and trust? I trusted it because of the script, the material that I read. It was so, it was so, it was so compact and, and, and well done. I say, if anybody can write this well and they wanted to direct, uh, I said, you know, with my expertise and all the experiences that I had, I think that we could blend them together and we could come up with something that would be pretty good. Yeah. Oh. And and the film as, as a whole is is really honoring Kenneth Chamberlain and, and his story and what happened to him. And at the same time, the film also really evokes a lot of discussion and, and a lot of conversation. And for you as a performer and an actor in the film, what are the conversations that you hope are really spurred into audiences from watching this and from the experience of, of seeing his story? Well, the major thing is that I want people to understand that Kenneth Chamberlain was a breathing, living human being that, that someone invaded his privacy and took his life. I want them to see the man. I want them to see that he had family. I want them to see that he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't, he wasn't a criminal. He wasn't breaking any rules. He, he just, he was a victim of circumstance. And I want them to understand that this thing, there were so many different ways that this situation could have been handled where the result would have been different. And I just wanted, I want to humanize Kenneth Chamberlain and so that people will know that uh, his life was not taken in vain and his family will, will be, will, will be, will get some sort of um, satisfaction in knowing that uh, maybe his death can provoke some sort of change. And, you know, you mentioned the fact of honor. I wanted to honor this man's life, the legacy of his life, because um, I think it's, it's, worth, it's, worth, it's worth that. This was a man who was in the military. He was a man who just came back at a lot, as many of our veterans do, they come back to, to, a, to, a, to a terrible lifestyle, you know, because, and, and they do that serving us in our country. So yes, that was high on my list. And uh, that's what I want people to take away from this when they see this. It sounds like it was it was a huge testament in the fact that his family members watched this film and said that they really saw him in it. And congratulations on everything with this. And thank you so much for, for sharing all of this with us. Oh, well, thank you guys for having me. And I really do appreciate you getting the word out there because I think that uh, it's a film that should be seen.